Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Angelica Heigert. I am the Interim Digital Editor for Canadian Geographic. As we get started tonight, I first wanted to acknowledge that our offices, the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, are located on the unceded territory of the Algonquin peoples who have been the guardians of and in relationship with these lands for thousands of years. We further acknowledge and recognize that our work reaches across all of the distinct First Nations, Métis homelands and Inuit Nunungat, and for this, we are grateful. I'm delighted tonight to be joined by Margaret McMillan, Professor of History at the University of Toronto, an Emeritus Professor of International History and the former Warden of St. Anthony's College at the University of Oxford. She has honorary degrees from a very long list of places, so bear with me. The University of King's College, the Royal Military College, the University of Western Ontario, Ryerson University, Huron University College of the University of Western Ontario, the University of Calgary, Memorial University of Newfoundland, Bishop's University, and the University of Toronto. In 2006, Professor McMillan was invested as an officer of the Order of Canada and in 2015 became a companion. In 2018, she became a companion of honour in the UK. And of course, she is a fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. Her recent book, War, How Conflict Shaped Us, is a provocative view of war as an essential component of humanity and our history. Margaret, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Oh, I'm delighted. I'm delighted. And thank you very much, Angelica, for that very nice introduction. Um, you may wonder why I'm talking to you about war when we're all in the midst of another great crisis, the, the pandemic, and possibly other crises to come. But I think there is something at least similar among the great sort of crises that have marked human history, whether these are pandemics like the ones we're enduring today, or the Black Death, of course, in the 14th and successive centuries, whether these great crises are revolutions, whether they're economic collapses or whether they're great wars. I think they all have certain things in common, and that is that they have often changed and affected the course of history. And, and I, I think this is, of course, why we are fascinated by them. But they also say things about the societies that are affected by them. Great crises, great wars, for example, test societies and test their leaders. How societies respond and how those leaders respond is affected by what they have been before the crisis hit. And so a society that is strong to begin with will respond in different ways from a society that is weak. If you think of the First World War, for example, an enormous strain on all the societies that fought in it, a strain both in terms of the demands on the human beings who went and fought and, and died in large numbers, but also a tremendous drain of resources and it required societies to organize themselves in ways that they hadn't really thought possible before. Some societies responded and managed, of course they were damaged by it, but Britain, France, even Germany, and of course the United States came out of the First World War still recognizable, still with their institutions, both social and political intact. Russia and Austria-Hungary did not withstand that strain. Austria-Hungary vanished literally from the face of the map, it was finished and Russia endured a revolution and then civil war, and then of course 70 years and more of communist dictatorship. And so how Russia and Austria-Hungary responded was different from the ways in which other countries responded. And I think what great crises, great wars can do is show the weaknesses in societies and sometimes make it impossible for those societies to continue on. But we know, and I think we're feeling it at the moment, that great crises can also oblige societies to reform themselves, to change the ways in which they do things, sometimes can produce beneficial results. Now, of course, we would not choose to get beneficial results in this way because the cost is very high, often, often unbearable. But it is one of the many paradoxes of the crises of history, and again, I'm thinking about war and, and the others, that sometimes they produce results which are beneficial in peacetime. We see this if we look at the past. Wars have promoted social change, for example. I think without the Great World Wars, women would have taken longer, certainly, to be fully integrated into political and economic life and social life in their own countries. Britain had resisted, the British government had resisted giving votes to women before the First World War on all sorts of grounds, but the basic argument was that women wouldn't know how to vote, they weren't involved in society at large, they, they wouldn't know what to do with politics, no point in giving them the vote. And of course, during the First World War, 
women filled many of the jobs that men had been doing because the men were needed at the front. And they showed that they could do those jobs. And their contribution to the war was recognized by the British government, as was the contribution of the British working classes. Very much the same sort of arguments had been made in the past about not giving working class men or working class women for that matter the vote because they weren't equipped educationally or in any other way to take part in deciding on the affairs of state. And what the First World War showed was that labor, as much as women, were essential to the war effort. And even before the war ended, the British government passed the Representation of People Act, which gave the vote to all working class men and gave the vote to all women over 30. And eventually, of course, that became all women as well. And so social change can often be expedited and speeded up by war. And so can changes in things like science and technology. What is too expensive in peacetime becomes essential in war. And an example which I'm sure many of you will know already is that of penicillin. It was discovered how to make penicillin well before the Second World War, but it was considered much too expensive to do. There was simply uh, no, there were no resources big enough to put this new potentially life-saving drug on, 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 on the market. When the war came, of course, suddenly the expense became less important, if not irrelevant, and penicillin was produced. It suddenly became possible to produce it and saved, of course, the lives of countless soldiers in the Second World War, but has also saved the lives of millions since. And so war can be an accelerator for better or worse of social change and can speed up innovation. Innovation too in the ways in which we govern ourselves. Governments, especially in great wars, tend to take great control over society and tend to find that they can squeeze resources out of societies through taxes and through allocation of, of resources and labor in ways that they hadn't imagined possible before the war. And once they have learned that, governments don't always go back to pre-war days. They, they take, and you can see this pattern in the 20th century, they take a more interventionist role in society. And so war is something like these other crises I've mentioned, something that both can shatter societies, but in a curious way can make them stronger, can promote the sort of changes that make those societies fairer and, and juster. And a lot of research has been done by people like Thomas Piketty, for example, or Walter Scheidel in California, arguing, and I'm persuaded by their arguments, that the times of greatest equality in many societies in the world, from Japan to Canada, came after the two world wars because the gap between the rich and the poor had been leveled or brought closer in the, in the war years, and much of that lingered on. So the periods of greatest equality in the modern world have been right after the two, the two world wars. So that's one of the things we think about when we think about war, and one of the things I find fascinating, this paradoxical nature of war, that it is immensely destructive. We know that, we know the costs of war, but it does have these consequences, unintended consequences, that can sometimes make societies different and indeed, I think, can make them better. Another paradox of war, I think, is in our own reactions to it. War is something that both fascinates us and repels us. And I think we need to deal with both those aspects of war. We all know the horrors of war. We all, I think, are aware of, of the costs of war, and, and we can see it even in the memorials around us with the lists of names on, on them of, of those who have died, often very young people in war. But I think we also have to admit to ourselves something of the attraction of war. If you go into a bookshop, you will see row after row of books on war. Some of the greatest works of art in the world have been produced by war, and not always to condemn war, although of course many have been. Picasso's Guernica, one of the greatest paintings in my view of the 20th century, was in reaction to the bombing of a small and defenseless Basque town in the Spanish Civil War. But you also get great epics like the Iliad, for example, which in their own ways, I think, show the horror of war, but also show something of the glory. And I think that fascination, that intrigue of war is something that we need to accept in ourselves. It is something that we puzzle about, we wonder about. We admire it, I think, in a way, the fact that those who, who fight in wars can behave in altruistic ways and can behave in brave ways that we, most of us in normal societies, wouldn't be expected to behave. And, and in fact, would be surprised if, and perhaps horrified if we found ourselves in that position. So war brings out both the best 
and the vilest in human nature. If you read war memoirs, and I'm sure many of you have, and I've, I've read a great many, what a lot of the soldiers will talk about is the comradeship, the fact that they're with people who will quite literally die for them, and they will probably be prepared to die for those people as well. And so there is that sense of comradeship in war, that sense of altruism, which you don't get for the most part in ordinary civilian life. And so it's it's one of the things we worry about and we, we try to understand about war, this combined attraction and repulsion that we feel. There are, of course, a great many questions about war and a great many debates about war, and I'm just going to touch on a few, but let, let me raise one of them because it is, I think, very important if we're trying to grasp the impact of war on human society, and that is how far back it goes. You know, there is war in almost every year of recorded history, and even before recorded history, we find evidence of war. Now, I define war in, I think, a simple but I think useful way, and that is it is organized violence. It's not the random violence you might get in a brawl outside a pub or a brawl on the ice after a hockey game or during a hockey game. It is organized violence. War is one organized group fighting in an organized way against another organized group. Violence is part of it, and sometimes, of course, that violence can be random. But the key thing, I think, to remember about war is that it is fought by groups, whether these are clans, whether these are tribes, whether these are nations, whether these are participants in civil wars, and it is fought in an organized way. If you think of the sheer amount of organization that it takes to create armed forces, to equip armed forces, to move armed forces, to discipline armed forces, to train them, to get them onto the battlefields, to supply them, to manage them while we're on the battlefields, I think we get a sense of why one anthropologist has called war the most organized of all human activities. It is an inordinately organized activity. As far as we can tell, it goes back a long way into human society. And I say as far as we can tell because the evidence the further back you go is, is scanter and more difficult, I think, to interpret. But there have been real advances in ancient archaeology, in testing ancient DNA in, in the last few decades. And I think we're now beginning to get a clearer picture of the role of violence in the past. And graves have been found millennia back, which show the signs, which, have be, which contain a number of, of skeletons, which show signs of trauma. In other words, it looks like they have been killed in some sort of organized violence. And as far back as we can tell, when human beings began settling down into agricultural settlements, they began to fight each other. And some of the earliest remnants of these early settlements contain walls. And you don't build walls around yourselves unless you are worried about what might happen to you. And so as far as we can tell, but of course the debate will go on, war goes back far into human society, is deeply embedded into human society, in human society. And another part of the debate is about how much organization and war affect each other. As societies become more organized, as they become settled agricultural societies, as they begin to develop hierarchies, because agriculture can produce a surplus that allows some people to work at other activities than agriculture. And so as societies become more organized, as they develop the managerial classes, as they develop ruling classes, as they develop the soldiers, are they more likely to fight? Does war promote organization in society or does society becoming organized promote war? And it's not a question I'm going to try and answer. I, I think it is like the old classic chicken and egg answer, which comes first. It's very difficult to tell. Without organization, you can't have war. Once you have war, you tend to get more organization. And so it seems to me that war and organization are inextricably intertwined and move along with each other. But certainly we can see in the modern age that war has produced stronger and stronger governments, governments assuming more and more control over society, therefore more able to use the resources of that society, whether it be the human beings or whether it be the material resources from the soil or, or from factories, more able to use those resources to fight its neighbors. And so the intimate relationship between war and, and society, I think, is one that, as far as we can tell, goes back a long way. One theorist has said that the war, the war made the state and the state made war. And I think it's as good an encapsulation of, of this complicated relationship as you can get.
Yet another question about war, and it's one that we, I think, have spent a lot of time thinking about in, in the past decades, is war innate? In other words, was, is the impulse to make war something deeply rooted in, in human society? Is it, in other words, biological? The argument, I think, is a complicated one. My own view is that we may have biological impulses, and, and this is what a number of archeologists and others, evolutionary biologists, seem to say, that we have, through evolution, developed certain impulses. If we feel frightened, we might flee, or we might lash out if we feel we have no alternative. But this is very different from the organized thing that is war. And I tend to come down on the side or support the side of those who say that war is affected by biology, but it is much more culturally determined. In fact, biology, in a way, may run counter to the need to make war, the requirements of war. If, if your impulse biologically is to flee or to lash out randomly, then in fact, you don't make a good warrior. What you need to make a warrior is a great deal of training. And in fact, you're training people often to overcome their basic instincts. You're training people to put themselves in harm's way. You're training people to take chances that natural impulses would, would not encourage them to do. And so I think if you look at the power of culture, the ways in which cultures encourage people to develop what are sort of warlike characteristics, if you think of that long line from say Sparta through to Prussia, uh, through to, to Japan, um, a long sort of evolution of, of warrior societies in which culture has promoted martial virtues. And it has been expected that young men, and, and they are often and mostly young men, will show those sort of qualities that make good soldiers. They will, will be ready to be, to be obedient. They'll be ready to sacrifice their lives. They will, of course, be ready also to take leadership roles when they, when they feel like it. So I think, the sheer organizational nature of war requires a great deal of cultural support, that you don't get people turned in to warriors simply because they feel like it one day, simply because they have the biological impulse. Training a warrior takes a great deal of training. It probably also is affected by the sort of culture which that warrior comes out of. If a warrior, if someone is being made into a warrior, if they come out of a culture in which those sort of qualities that make good warriors have already been inculcated, then it will be quicker to train them as warriors. And so war is something I think that is very culturally driven. It changes, of course, with the nature of those societies which fight it. And so if you get societies which are very hierarchical, in which very few people control the means of wealth, in which there is a warrior caste, most people will not be expected to fight. War will be something that is done by elites. And so when you get changes in society where more and more people become citizens, become participants in society, then conversely, more and more people will be called upon to fight. And in fact, will feel that they should fight to defend that society. War also changes with innovation and technology. Certain things will come along which will transform war as long as the societies that are fighting or preparing to fight are prepared to use them. And so when the horse began to appear, in Central Asia and then began to move out of Central Asia, it promoted a new kind of fighting. People on horses could fight in different ways. They could fight faster, they could maneuver more than people on foot. When steel was developed, weapons became that much more deadly than when they were made out of bronze or iron. And of course, when gunpowder in the modern age, when gunpowder began to be used for war, then war took on a new and more deadly aspect. And so we have moved through various stages of innovation. And of course, today, we are now co contemplating the meaning of artificial intelligence in war and a whole new arena uh, is opening in war. And so I think we look at war and we should look at war, not just as something that involves the military going out to fight. That is part of war, but I think a very important part of war is the underpinnings of war, the culture, the people who fight, the nature of those who fight, the societies who organize the fighting, but also the weapons with which they fight, the technology which they have available. Of course, not all technologies are adopted, not all technologies become part of war. The Japanese in, in the 18th century had the opportunity to use gunpowder and to use modern weapons more than they wanted to, and for various reasons they chose at that time not to adopt them. And societies also change culturally. If you think of what Sweden used to be like in the Thirty Years' War, 
in Europe, 17th century, Swedish soldiers were a byword for their ferocity and for their cruelty. And even into the 18th century, if you were anywhere around and Swedish army came marching along, you'd want to get out of the way. You, the Swedes were not the sort of people that they have since become. I mean, we now think of Sweden as, as a very passable, peaceable society. Sorry, I didn't mean passable, I meant peaceable. Very peaceable society, which is both tolerant and, and cohesive. Um, this was not the Sweden of two or 300 years ago. And so change happens. If you think of Prussia, which lay at the heart of the new state of Germany in the 19th century, it was a state in which certainly the upper classes were encouraged to think of making war and encouraged to prepare themselves for war. And of course, Germany today is a very different country, as in fact is most of Europe. A recent book has asked about the Europe of the post-1945 period, where have all the soldiers gone? There has been a tremendous cultural shift in Europe um, in countries right from Britain, right across eastwards to, to, to the middle of Europe, where people no longer see fighting and war as something that is desirable. And that cultural shift, I think, is, is extremely significant. Yet another question. I'm going to stop soon, but I just have a couple of questions um, that I want to just put out there, and I'm hoping you will ask me some questions. So I just, this is not the COVID, this is hay fever, so excuse me. Um, the role of women in war. Um, it is striking that something like 99.9% .9 probably of those who have fought in war have been men, at least up until the present age. And it's a question. It's a, it's a very interesting question. Again, there is debate about it. Is it biological? Is it cultural? And again, I would come down on the, on the cultural side. And the argument used to be that men were the warriors, women were the nurturers, that women stayed at home, women tended the family, looked after the hearth, while the men went off to fight. But if you look through the past, you can find, and people are finding more and more examples of women who did fight. It used to be thought that Amazons were a figment of the Greeks' imagination, something that the Greeks had probably dreamed up to terrify themselves. The idea that you could have women who would be so unnatural as to fight was as terrifying as something like the Medusa. Now we know, thanks to archeologists, that in fact, there were women warriors in the classical period. Tombs, grave sites have been found around the North shore of the Black Sea, for example, which have skeletons in them, surrounded by what appear to be weapons. And those skeletons can now be identified as the skeletons of women. And so the myth actually turns out to have been based on reality. And of course, through history, there have been women who have disguised themselves as men and who have fought very successfully. In the Second World War, Soviet women fought in combat roles. They volunteered, they fought as fighter pilots, they manned artillery, artillery battalions, they fought as guerrillas. There's a wonderful book, if you have time to read it, by Svetlana Alexievich called The Unwomanly Face of War, where she interviews a lot of these women who did fight for the Soviet Union in the Second World War. And today, of course, women in a number of armed forces around the world are not just in the armed forces, but they're in combat roles. I was, I was at a Zoom seminar recently with a group of, of mid-career officers in Washington who were doing an MA in, in, in strategic studies. And we went around the table and they all introduced themselves. And I was surprised actually by what some of these young women were doing. One who looked to me very young indeed told me she was a fighter pilot in the Marines. Another one was, was in military intelligence. And so there seems to be now in modern armies not so much distinction between the sorts of things that men and women do anymore. And if women also, women have been involved in, in wars in other ways, if they haven't been combatants as much, and that's certainly true to the modern time, they have unfortunately suffered the consequences of war. They have been, along with, of course, male civilians of all ages, they have been war's victims. We tend to forget perhaps just how much of a price civilians pay in war and how, how dreadful war can be for civilians. So often civilians are attacked as a way of weakening the will and the capacity of the other side to want to fight on. Uh, and women also suffer a particular fate in war. They're often prizes of war. They'll be carried off to be made part of, of some victorious man's household. And rape is used as a weapon of war against women. In Bosnia, for example, in the 1990s, as Yugoslavia broke up, 
Serb nationalists, some of those um, ruthless groups made up of Serb nationalists, deliberately raped Bosnian Muslim women as a way of trying to destroy the Bosnian Muslim race and also to destroy the will of, of the Bosnian Muslims to fight on. And finally, we should not forget, women have sometimes been cheerleaders for war. And women are not always pacifist, although many have been, but they have also acted as cheerleaders. You need only think of the women who went around in the First World War, both in the United Kingdom, but also in Canada, handing out white feathers to men who were of military age, but weren't in military uniform to understand the role that women can play as, as cheerleaders. Well, war has taken many faces of many guises during the long history, but I think there was a significant change in the 19th century. And I think because that's so much part of our world, I just want to say something about it very briefly. In the 19th century, two major changes affected war and its relationship to society. And they came almost at the same time. And so I'm in no particular order, these were nationalism and the industrial revolution. What nationalism did and it predated the French Revolution, but I think was very much part of the French Revolution, was create a new relationship between peoples living in a society, a new relationship between those who ruled and those who were ruled. And so where peoples were largely subjects of their rulers, they became citizens. In other words, they participated in the affairs of state and they had a say in what sort of government they were going to get. And that meant a number of things. It meant that people identified or came to identify more passionately with their own nation, their own state, but it also meant that they had a corresponding obligation now to come to the defense of that state. And so a new sort of relationship was created and the wars fought by nationalists, the wars of the nations tended to have a ferocity that the more limited wars of the 19th century, of the 18th century didn't have, because it was no longer just armed forces fighting against each other or one ruler fighting against each other, it was now a whole people. And that meant that the possible opponents expanded as well, because you're no longer, if you're fighting as a nation, fighting just against an enemy army or enemy navy, you're now fighting against a whole people and a whole society. And so war became more vicious and its objects greater in the 19th century. And because of the Industrial Revolution, that became a reality. You can have great, great, great aims of, of conquering your opponents, but if you don't have the equipment to do it, then you're not going to be able to achieve those aims. But by the 19th century, and as the century wore on, this was more and more the case, it became possible to attack the other side and to keep up a war over long periods of time and over great stretches of country. And so the Industrial Revolution made it possible to move a lot of soldiers around, made it possible to feed them, keep them in the field, and to produce all the equipment they needed to fight. That in turn, the horrors that, that began to appear in war, the total wars that began to appear in the 19th century, and then of course in the 20th century, sparked yet another round in what has been an equally long attempt in human history, and that is to control war and to limit war and perhaps even to outlaw war, because almost as soon as we got war, we began thinking of ways in which we could possibly limit it and get rid of it. And so there is almost an equally long history of peace, peace making and peace movements as there is of war. From the Greeks, for example, who did not fight wars on special days or, or during the Olympics, right up to the present where we try to limit war and we try to do arms agreements, we try to set up rules of war. And in the 19th century, in response to what was happening to war, we got a renewed attempt to do this. And we still have it, of course, today. So why should we look at this long and, and rather horrible history of war, uh, which I've sketched out very briefly? Why should we not simply stop thinking about it? Uh, perhaps it's even a mistake to try and, and look at war. And I, my argument is that its impact on history has been so great that we need to take war into consideration if we're to understand how the past turned out the way it did and how our world turned out the way it did. We just have to ask ourselves what the world would be like if certain wars had gone the other way, if the Nazis and their allies had won the Second World War. What sort of world would we be living in? If earlier on the Ottoman Empire had managed to conquer the center, center of Europe, which it came close to doing on a couple of occasions, would the whole history of Europe have been very different? And I think we can say that it probably would. I think there's another reason, however, and I'll leave you with this thought, why we need to study war. And it's not just because of the past, but because war is still with us. 
a lot of us living in the Western world have been extremely lucky. We've lived in a world that has seen peace. A lot of people talk about the long peace that has existed since 1945, since the end of the Second World War. But that long peace has only been for certain people in certain parts of the world. There has been a war almost every year, somewhere in the world since 1945. Millions of people have died since 1945. Millions more have become refugees and have suffered the consequences of war. And so I think we need to think about war because it is still very much with us. And I suspect it is going to be with us in the future. The preparations for wars still go on. And so why I want to think about war myself, and I hope perhaps you will think about it too, is that it is something that we need to take very seriously and we need to do our best to try and understand. I, I don't want to end on a pessimistic note, and I think we can take some confidence in the fact that so many around the world don't want war, but I think we always have to be prepared for its possibility. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret. That was so fascinating. I, as a child, I ha was lucky enough to have a great, great grandmother alive at one point. And uh, listening to the stories, even though I was probably too young to hear them, of my, my great great grandmother and my great grandmother and their, their duties during the war um, has always fascinated with me. And so I was especially interested in your comments about women in the war. Um, and I definitely enjoyed those parts of your book. We have so many comments coming in on our chat. So thank you so much to everybody who has sent a, a question so far. Please continue to send your questions. I'm going to ask Margaret your questions for you. Um, and we will get to as many as we can, I promise. Um, so uh, of course, there is you know this global pandemic that is happening, which is why we are virtual today instead of in our lovely Alex Trebek Theater here at 50 Sussex. And so a few uh, questions have come in, one from Tom Cullen. What lessons from the crises of, of war might we take into the crises of COVID and then even further into the crises of, of climate change and climate breakdowns? Well, I think what lessons we should take is, is to look at what's worked and what has worked in the present pandemic has been, I think, um, leadership. I think it does matter, but leadership is no good without people who are prepared to follow those leaders. And we've seen in countries where there is a degree of trust between the leaders and the people, and it goes both ways. You know, I think leaders have to trust their people to actually understand the gravity of what is, is, is going on and to understand the recommendations that are being made. But the trust has to be also people have to trust their leaders that they are actually doing their best. And the societies which have had that degree of trust and have had competent leadership seem to me to have coped best. And these are mostly, but not all, democratic societies. I mean, clearly China is not a democratic society, but I think in China, the public has confidence in its leaders. It, it certainly has criticism of them as well, but I think they have confidence in the leaders. And I think that the Chinese leadership have taken a very clear lead, which I think the Chinese have found um, something that they can respond to. Societies like South Korea, Japan, democratic societies, again, have shown how peoples can work together when it, there is that right combination. And so I think what we can take from that is that we need to really make sure that we have strong social institutions and that we have a society in which all segments of society are cared for. I mean, some of the worst COVID rates have been in societies where the poor have simply not been given the resources that they need and not given the resources normally and have not been given the resources during this period. And so I think we, we can take lessons from this. We can also take some confidence that when we face as, as, a, as a species a big crisis, we can sometimes rise to the challenge. So let's hope we can do it with climate change. I guess to uh, to elaborate on that and to look at kind of the developmental roles that war has played in the past, can there be a developmental role um, in the crises uh, like cold like the the Cold War and the crises that require mass mobilization like these pandemics? Can they play a similar developmental role? I think they can because what this crisis has done among well, what it's done is speed up research and speed up our understanding of the disease. And I think, for a lot of us, not necessarily for all of us, unfortunately, but for a lot of us, the pandemic has made us recognize that we need international organizations. You know, pandemics, viruses don't stop at borders. You know, they don't suddenly stop. And I think we've realized that this is an international problem. And I think there has been a high degree of international cooperation. I think 
One of the problems, of course, has been that the United States, the most powerful nation in the world, has not taken a leadership role in this and has just chosen this moment to withdraw from the World Health Organization. And that, I think, is a pity. But we can do it. We've, we've shown that we can do it. And I think what's also been shown during this crisis is that governments can spend money when they need to. You know, there's been a lot of talk about austerity and, and balancing budgets and cutting back expenditure. And in the past seven months, governments, even in places like Britain, a conservative government, which was committed seven months ago to austerity, is spending money hand over fist. And I, so I think we, 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 we break certain taboos when we have a crisis and we, we mobilize in certain ways. And let's hope that we remember we can do it. I'm not suggesting that we need to go on spending money wildly for, for, for the indefinite future, but let's realize that we can mobilize the resources of society and that we can actually co cooperate with each other to deal with crises. Um, another question here from uh, Aaron Huguet. I apologize if I, if I said your name incorrectly. Um, what, in your opinion, are the most significant tech advances or innovations out of the Great War era? Well, out of the Great War era, um, both good and bad, um, poison gas was a big technological advance, unfortunately, and still is still with us. Um, improvements in weapons, the airplane, a tremendous amount of development during the First World War. And of course, the tank was the great technological, one of the great technological innovations of the First World War. But there were also very important innovations in medicine and in things like feeding populations and the use of rationing and, and, and beginning to understand nutrition when it came to feeding civilian populations and soldiers. But huge advances in medicine, I mean, it, in, a, in a horrible way because there were so many wounded to practice on, or not practice on, but because they, they needed to be treated. But big advances were made in treating trauma on and off battlefields and in things like, like facial reconstruction, um, because so much damage was done to, to, to people through artillery in, in the First World War and, and through gas. And so, yes, there were technological innovations. And, and what war tends to do is speed it up. Same thing happened in the Second World War. I and mean, the jet engine comes out of the Second World War um, as alas, uh, as alas does, does the atomic bomb. But wars tend to speed up technological innovation. Speaking of technological innovation, obviously today we are living in the world of, of AI and drones and all kinds of different things. And so Cecile's question here is, will tech advances like drones and, and AI, will they separate societies from war? That's a good question and I think a worrying one um, because what high technology can do is detach the people exerting it from those it's being exerted on. And so you can get people in the Southwest United States directing drones to targets in Afghanistan and not necessarily seeing the consequences of what those drones do. And I think it might be possible for people not to really feel the consequences of what war does. Um, so I think, yes, there is a danger. And I think there's a, there's a more general danger, and that is that whatever wars have been fought since 1945 have been fought in the, mostly in the less developed parts of the world. And so it's easy enough or too easy for, for us in the developed world to say, oh, well, it's just happening over there and those people tend to fight a lot. I mean, that was the sort of thing that was said when Yugoslavia was breaking up. Um, so there is, I think that is a worry. Is there, is there anything we can do to, to better adapt to, to using those kinds of technologies um, and recognizing like how they play a role in war? Well, there is a big attempt being made to try and control um, artificial intelligence in war. I mean, there, there are a number of self-guided weapons, not just drones, but there are now a number of self-guided weapons which basically um, direct themselves. And there is talk of building um, inhibitions into them so that they won't attack certain kinds of targets or that they will consult before they do. But that relies on people actually agreeing on what those sort of inhibitions should be. And I suspect we may not get very far with that. I mean, that, that seems to me a real problem. Um, and you know, the, one of the sort of nightmarish fears is that we might get weapons, high tech weapons being guided by artificial intelligence, which somehow free themselves from human control. Um, now, this may be science fiction, but it's something that I think at least we need to worry about. People who write science fiction sometimes get it right. <laughs> I think a lot of what, uh, you know, would a lot of the technology we have today was science fiction, you know, back in the Great War era as well. So yeah. it, it does all come to uh, fruition at some point.
Um, another question here from John Hovland, are societies without conscription more likely to go to war given that the governing class can limit the risk of war to themselves and their offspring? It's an interesting argument and, and it may well be right. I mean, what is striking about the First and Second World Wars is that all segments of societies felt it. And in all segments of society, people felt losses. In fact, um, in the First World War, it was the young um, who became officers, which meant they were mainly from the upper and upper middle classes who had a very high death rate because they were expected to get out and leave their soldiers. Um, you know, so, so sometimes I think, you know, that yes, I think that can, that that is important, that you should get some sort of sharing of the burdens of war. And what conscription can do, and it, the evidence is, is quite interesting, is it by throwing together people from different social classes and different areas and dif different ethnicities, it can actually make them more aware of each other and, and make them get on with each other. Um, you know, what, what comes out in, in a number of the things, a number of the letters that young British officers wrote home, for example, in the First World War, is they, they had to read their men's letters, but they had to censor them. And they often made comments like, you know, these, these people have very good, you know, they, they have very good ideas and they care about poetry and they care about the same things we do. So I think war can be a social leveler as well as an economic leveler. And so I think in that way, conscription is good. But the danger of conscription, of course, is that you get mass armies and the temptation to use them is that much the greater. We seem at the moment to be moving to small professional armies. And of course, the danger there is that those who go and fight and get killed don't really leave an impact on the rest of society. And increasingly, you see in countries such as the United States, people who go into the armed forces being drawn from certain sections of society, often rural recruits or people from the poorer parts of the big cities. And so for a lot of people in elite positions in politics or universities or government, they just don't know soldiers. And I think that makes it perhaps easier to use them and not worry about them. So yeah, I think it, it's very tricky. I mean, I think there are arguments on both sides, um, both for small professional armies and for conscription. And kind of along those lines, Susanna asks, do you think war creates more inequity or does it simply expose inequity that already exists? It's, I think, depends very much on the war. Um, and, you know, I think the bigger, you know, the, the, the more total the war, the more that war involves the whole of society, I think it can bring greater social equality. Um, it depends very much on how those in charge deal with it. I mean, if the burden is not fairly shared, if, for example, you, you get people who can simply ignore rationing and can buy whatever they want, then I think that begins to have a very bad social impact. But if you have a society, if you have some Britain, and Britain wasn't perfect during the Second World War, but even the well-to-do found there were certain things their money would no longer buy. Um, and that I think was a very good thing. And it was good on both sides. I think it made the rich realize they'd been living in a protected bubble and it, it, made, it was good for the rest of society to see this happening. And so war can certainly expose social inequities, but it can sometimes, depending on what governments and societies do, it can actually level off some of those inequities. Um, you know, they say that children in the poorer parts of London, for example, were eating better during the Second World War than they had ever eaten before. And you could see it in their growth rates. Um, they, were, they, were, they were bigger and they were healthier because they were getting balanced diets, which their parents had not been able to afford to give them. Wow, I, that's so fascinating. I had no idea. Um, another question here. Uh, if we recognize that major wars lead to social upheaval, can we consciously use war to promote good? Um, promoting good is, is tricky, isn't it? Um, it's who's defining it and what good is. I think we don't use wars to promote good, but I think we use wars sometimes to avoid evil. And so... The choice, I think, for the democracies in 1939 and in the years after was what to do about the Axis powers and how to stop them. And there was no way of stopping them short of war. Um, they were bent. Hitler in particular was bent on war and, and the Japanese militarists then became bent on war. And so you can't stop nations or peoples like that once they decide on war, except by fighting yourself, by, by applying force against them. And that's not necessarily creating good, but I think it's avoiding a greater evil. I think the democracies were right to fight against the Axis powers in, in, in the Second World War because the alternative would have been literally horrific. 
another question here. Uh, while war may be cultural rather than biological, if the tendency to become organized, such as when molecules form complex structures and evolution marches from on from amoeba to more complex organisms, that tendency to become organized is, is inevitable. Is war inevitable in the human species? And is there a way that society can continue to progress without war being involved? Well, that's the old, old question. Um, and it goes right back, I think, to the first times we become organized. I mean. The evidence is that with organization, you, you, you get war. Um, it's possible to wage war once you're organized and, and the fear of war will make you more organized and the need to wage war will make you more organized. Um, yes, of course, it's possible to do it in other ways and it is possible to use organization for good ends, not for warlike ends. And we, we've done it before, you know, we, would, we can see it during the pandemic. We can see that it is possible for us to work together for a common goal and, and people work. I mean, one of the things that has struck me I mean, we've read lots in the papers about people who've been breaking quarantine and going out and going to parties. But what really strikes me is how most people have accepted and understood the restrictions on their movements and have actually organized themselves at the grassroots to do things. I mean, I, I was very struck in Toronto, but also in the UK, how neighbors got together to organize, to help each other, to help those who couldn't get out, who were too frail, and also just to set up things like food kitchens for, for the neighborhood and to take meals to people who couldn't cook their own meals. So, you know, I think we have the capacity to organize ourselves for peaceful ends, and we certainly do. But so often throughout history, we've organized for war, and, and I don't see it going away anytime soon. I'd like to think it would, but I think, you know, we will continue to organize for war. We have to hope we don't use it. Um, looking back again, we have a question here from uh, Gavin Fitch, um, a name I'm sure you will recognize. Uh, your comments about the change in Europeans' views about war since World War II is interesting. After hundreds of years of waging war, what was it about World War II that caused this change? I think, and, and there's a lot of speculation about this, I think it's the combination of the two world wars. The First World War, for a lot of Europeans, at the end of the First World War, a lot of Europeans said, we, we've destroyed ourselves. We have damaged ourselves so badly that we'll never really recover. Well, they did recover, sort of, and then they had a Second World War. And I think for many Europeans, this was just too much. They had nearly destroyed themselves in the First World War, and they had come close to destroying themselves again in the Second World War. And this, the impact of the Second World War was even greater, if, 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 if it's, it's maybe hard to believe, but even greater than the First World War, because it affected civilians so much more. It affected those who fought, but also the civilians. And cities were leveled because of the technology, because of airplanes and bombs and long-range artillery. Now, a huge proportion of, of Europe's built heritage was utterly destroyed. And I think for a lot of Europeans, both the First and Second World Wars, and of course, a lot of people lived through both, was simply so shocking and so fundamentally disturbing that they felt they simply couldn't continue like this. I mean, it's out of the Second World War that you, and it, but it's there in the first, at the end of the First World War too, that you get people talking about setting up a European community. And the impulse behind the European, the original part was about coal and steel, but it grew into the European Union eventually, was not just about economics. It was always about getting over these national competitions that had created such horror in Europe. And so I think there's just simply been a change in attitudes and in an education. I mean, the young are not taught that war is glorious. Successive generations have been taught that war is terrible and that they don't want to grow up to be soldiers. And I think it has had, I mean, you know, I find Germany extraordinary. I mean, Germany, which used to be um, a country, certainly in Prussia, where war was celebrated by large sections of society has become a very peaceable country. Um, and I think it really is the impact of, of war and in the case of Germany, a dreadful defeat as well and, and, and a knowledge of, of the crimes that the Germans had carried out during the Second World War. Speaking about kind of this competition mindset um, in another competition vein. Uh, so of course, war leads to innovation and a lot of you know advances in medicine and technology, but war could also prevent collaboration between scientists that are on opposite sides who are at war with each other. So to what extent could war prevent innovation by suppressing that collaboration or even by suppressing the losing side's culture? Well, I think, yes, I mean, collaboration stops during war, um, and you see it very strikingly. I mean, the, 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 those, who, those who are nuclear physicists 
before the Second World War did it because they loved it. There was nothing in it for them. They didn't know that nuclear physics was going to produce the splitting of the atom. I and mean, this was theoretical. And it was a very small community. I mean, there were Russians involved. There, was, there were people at Cambridge. There were a few people in Italy. There were a few people in the United States. But they all knew each other. Um, and Niels Bohr, for example, in, in Denmark. And they used to meet at conferences and they used to exchange papers. And governments didn't bother much about them because what they were doing was so esoteric. And so they were doing it for the love of it. And of course, when the war came and when it became, seemed to become possible that in fact, there could be something um, of a new and, and terrifying weapon if you could only figure out how to split the atom. Um, then of course that community was divided and they were no longer able to talk to each other. But you know, that, that I think is a good example. And, and well, perhaps we, we wish they'd never split the atom in the first place, but no, scientific communities can be torn to pieces but in the case of in the case of, of, of wars, yes, that does happen. But sometimes when, when the war ends, they can begin to collaborate again. Now, of course, this question had to come up because we are, are of course, Canadian Geographic and the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. And we're all here because we have some interest in geography. Mm -hmm. Does the geography in which people live influence their propensity towards war or the nature of any war that emerges? It's an old argument, and I, I don't know where I come down on it, but certainly if you live in certain types of, of geography, you, you will adopt and adapt certain kinds of technologies, and those may well affect how you fight war. I mean, you don't get landlocked nations, for example, having navies. I mean, it, it seems like an obvious one, but island nations, which depend on trade, have to find ways of protecting that trade. And so it's no accident that the British, the Dutch, the Japanese um, all built big navies, because for them, navies were simply something that you needed. And so, yes, I think geography can affect how you fight war, and, and it can affect the types of wars you can fight it, in it. I mean, you can't fight guerrilla war on open plains. You know, it would be hard to fight a guerrilla war in, in, say, the southern part of Manitoba or Saskatchewan, because everyone could see you coming. But you could fight a guerrilla war in the Rockies, or you could fight a guerrilla war in northern Ontario where you have lots of places to hide and, and places you can move around. So yes, I think geography affects the nature of the war and, and will affect the choices that a people make as they choose what sort of wars and what sort of preparations they want to make. It, it affects societies in all sorts of ways. <clears throat> Uh, it has been proposed, this question comes from Tom Cullen, it has been proposed that the objective of territorial acquisition of war has been accepted as obsolete at the end of World War II. Would you agree? Well, I would have agreed a little while ago because it did seem that territorial ac acquisition by force was simply not tolerated anymore, whereas, of course, it was tolerated for centuries. I mean, you know, what you, th you, th you think of the Treaty of Utrecht at the end of the Seven Years' War, where territories were swapped around and, and taken as prizes in war. So yes, I think it was always understood that you, if you grabbed a piece of territory and you could establish control over it, you had a very good chance of hanging on to it in any subsequent peace settlement. After the Second World War, the that principle was no longer accepted. In fact, it wasn't even accepted after the First World War. It, it was falling out of use in the 19th century. Um, it just seemed some, somehow, at least certainly in Europe, to be part of the past. And so other sorts of reasons had to be, be, be made um, for taking territory, but you couldn't say, I just, I've got it, I'm hanging on to it. Um, but what has happened in recent years is that a number of states or a couple of states have taken territory from another state and have got away with it. I mean, I, the, the, the key example, I think, is Russia's seizing of Crimea. And the, it has paid really surprising little penalty for it. It's illegal. There have been sanctions imposed on Russia, but it hasn't really affected how Russia behaves. And it has been a breach, I think, of that very important, um, and I think actually stabilizing principle that you cannot seize each other's territory by force. And we'll have to see what happens with Israel now, because certainly the Netanyahu government is speaking and behaving in ways that indicate that it would like to annex parts of territory in, in, in the West Bank. And that again will be a breach and, and I think is moving towards a breach of that old, um, at least quite old principle since 1945. And if that is happening, and if others see it, then we may find others tempted to try and seize territory as well, um, you know, that does not necessarily belong to them. And they, they will make arguments, you know, why it should belong to them, but they will seize it by force. And so no, I, th I think we're in a rather dangerous moment now. <clears throat> 
when it comes to war as an overall concept, we've obviously we've we've discussed, you know, both the catastrophic and the positive. But when you look at war on a micro level, the boots on the ground soldier, is there any kind of of impact that's not catastrophic for those for the the individual? You have to ask the individuals themselves. And what is interesting is, is their evidence is mixed. Um, you know, fighting is something that a lot of soldiers don't ever want to do again. But we have to accept the fact that there are some who enjoy it. There are those, you know, like Achilles in, in the Iliad, who are, see themselves as warriors. That's what they are. And that's what gives them meaning. And I think of a more modern, um, not equivalent exactly, but a more modern sort of a cultural a telling of war. And, and I don't know how many of you have seen The Hurt Locker, um, very interesting movie about a bomb disposal expert mm -hmm. who is in Iraq, it looks like, I think, and lives on the edge and is constantly on the edge, comes back to the United States and cannot adapt. He misses um, the, the sort of excitement and he misses the adrenaline. So there is that side. I mean, there are th these may not be many people in this world, but there are those who find something in war that is exhilarating. And there are those who remember war if they survive it as something where they did have this comradeship. It's the thing that comes out again and again. And you get it, you know, in that, that wonderful novel, All Quiet on the Western Front, where the protagonist goes home and he said, I want to be back at the front because they were my friends and I want to be with them and I want to know what's happening to them. And so this is not something that, you know, all soldiers feel, but it's certainly a part of war. And I think that's part of the reason so many soldiers after wars join veterans associations because in a way it, it enables them to, to keep something of that side. So not all soldiers hate war, but I think a lot never want to talk about it again. I mean, equally common are those who never want to talk about it again and try and, and just let those memories go. Um, and sometimes of course, it's very hard for them to go. I mean, you know, I've heard of people who kind of came back from the, the First World War would never talk about it, but had nightmares every night. So how war affects people, I think depends partly on, on what has happened to them in the war, but partly also on what sort of person they are or how the war has affected them. Now, before I let you go, um, I thank you so much everybody for your questions and thank you so much, Margaret, for your time. I have one more easy question for you. We're mm -hmm. going to put your, your book link um, in the chat again. I, there have been a number of comments of people rushing off to Audible to download the audio version. I read a digital version. So people are, are flocking to get your book. Um, mm -hmm. And we're going to put that link in the chat so people can purchase it easily if they don't already have it. Um, but what book about war would be your favorite? And it can't be one of yours. No, well, I no, I, I would never choose one of my own as, as a favorite. What, what, what would my favorite book about war be? It's a difficult question. I mean, I think The Iliad is one of the most extraordinary books. And, and I read it before I started writing this book. And, and I've read it again often. And I think it is absolutely extraordinary. But they're also, they're wonderful novels. Um, a novel I, I hadn't read before I started doing this book was Tim O'Brien, The Things They Carried About Vietnam. And I think it is one of the great war novels. Um, it's a series of linked stories and they're deceptively simple, but they're haunting. Um, they stay with you. And the one I mentioned earlier, the Svetlana Alexievich one, The Unwomanly Face of War. You know, she she's this extraordinary Belarusian writer at the moment, I think, under house arrest because she's displeased the, the ghastly president of Belarus. Um, but it's an extraordinary compendium of women's memories, which she weaves together with, with great skill. So I've got lots of favorites. I <laughs> Those are three that I'm thinking of at the moment. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much to everyone who has joined us this evening. If you are interested in helping us support uh, the, the talks that we do, we do another one coming up on December the 3rd with uh, Ian McMichael or Ian DeJardin from the McMichael Gallery in Toronto. So we're looking forward to that one. Uh, if you're interested in helping us put on events like these, please head to rcgs.org slash donate and you can help us make this kind of thing happen. Uh, my name is Angelica. Again, I'm the digital editor for Canadian Geographic. Margaret, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Well, thank you. And thank you all you virtual audience for your questions. <laughs>